Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fash Sawyer. I'm the Chief Transformation Officer at Every. Every used to be called Hermes ParcelNet, so if you're not familiar with Every, you may be familiar with, uh, with Hermes. Um, and you know, what, what we do as a business is we, we deliver parcels for retailers, so a, a number of the organizations in this room are clients of ours. Um, we are, I think, the second biggest parcel delivery business in the UK after the Royal Mail in terms of volume. In terms of your question, um, I think the sad truth is that the supply chain shocks and the instability that we've seen is likely to be with us for some time. Um, you know, it, it seems as though <clears throat> we've just kind of, as, as an industry, just been moving from one crisis to the next, right? So, you know, if it, the, 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 you know the, clearly the pandemic was a major challenge, uh, positively and negatively for, for businesses, and then we've been through significant labor disruption. We're going through significant energy, cost inflation. Um, so these are all challenges that we're, or, or everyone in this room is dealing with. Um, we've got our own strategies in place, and I can elaborate on those later to sort of minimize those impacts. Um, but overall, I, you know, I, my, my, my instinct tells me that you know, we're in for a continued bumpy ride, frankly, um, and, and I think volatility is going to be the name of the game going forward. Thank you for your honest perspective there, and, and Gerard. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, Jerry Lavin, I'm the MBA field CTO at Citrix, uh, that means that I, I spend a lot of time with some of our largest, most strategic customers exchanging ideas and how we can, we can better help them. For those of you who aren't familiar with Citrix, um, we produce solutions that help people with remote hybrid work and the secure delivery of their applications. And We deal with a number of, of your organizations um, that are here today, um, I think specific to that question. Um, I'm probably going to sound like I'm on the same doom and gloom bandwagon to a certain degree. I think there's a lot of factors out there at the moment, some of them outside the control of any one person in this room or, or within this country. Uh, there's geopolitical events, there's obviously the, the very unfortunate war in the Ukraine at the moment. Um, there's the, the inflationary situation that we're in. But there's also, I, I, I think maybe to be a little bit more positive, there's a, there is some light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. Um, businesses are looking at ways that they can take advantage of digitization and take advantage of different working practices and transformative practices that may help change the way that they can you know, deal with some of these bottlenecks. I, I think the other thing that the pandemic showed us is that we have to, well, effectively plans are pretty much useless, but we need to do an awful lot of planning because those unprecedented situations, the, the black swan type events, we don't know what's around the corner. So I think a lot of businesses start to build in more resiliency into their planning. And the time to do that for businesses that are transforming is at the initial inception phase. So I think that will help us be more resilient going forward. So I, I expect bumpy rides. I think uh, there was a, an article from Gartner when they were talking about the CIO for the next few years needs to hurdle, not sprint. Um, but definitely, I think there's things we can do together um, as, as par in partnership, together with our different organizations to help us become more resilient. Thank you. And Sam? Um, Samuel Jennigan. I'm the founder, and I've been running Strong Roots for the last uh, seven years now. Um, very much the small potato of the bunch. Um, we, uh, we sell delicious food. Um, healthy plant-based frozen food in all the major retailers uh, in the UK and about 15 other territories as well. Um, we started in Ireland in 2015 and I was just sharing in the green room that um, the day we secured our first major retail contract in the UK was the day that Brexit was announced. So we've been going through this transformation and adapting and being agile as a food company since the beginning. Thank you, Sam. I was kind of hoping you'd all say it would be sold next week, but I, I suspected you might not. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yes, there is that. Um, and Sam, I wondered if we could just sort of go into a bit more depth now about, about some of the changes that we've seen in recent years. And, and Sam, you've been um, scaling up your startup during this time of immense disruption. I just wondered if you could talk us through a bit more 
what that's been like and are there kind of ad advantages to the fact that you're doing some of these things for the first time or is it kind of pure mm. double whammy and, and sort of part b of my question relates to the length of supply chains um obviously you're selling veg you're kind of at the heart of that there's been a lot of talk of shortening supply chains yeah. um since the pandemic you know what's your view on that and and do you view a relatively short supply chain as a, as a desirable thing for your company um Yes. So, I mean, we've been, we've been fortunate in that the genesis of our business happened at the same time as an emergence of, you know, increased veganism and flexitarian consumption of food, um, which um, has helped us, you know, be carried by the tide through the various different regional launches that we've done. Um, the demand and the pull from the consumer has negated a lot of the traditional marketing push that needs to be done um, by communication of, of early stage brands and also the, the appetite from retailers to improve the, the range and variety of products that they have on the shelves. Um, the second part, um, I think um, we, we're a B Corp, so a big part of our day-to-day -day running is not just about profitability but also about people and planet at the same time. And as part of those goals and efforts, we've actively tried to reduce our supply chain length anyway. So it's an active part of our supply chain that, you know, since 2017, we've been migrating as much as possible towards the UK for the UK market. And then similarly, when we launched in the US after 2019, re-established manufacturing supply chain from 2020 onwards uh, there as well. So for us, it's twofold. One is um, to do with our climate footprint and the act of reduction of, of how we're shipping things around the world. Um, the second piece is because it's necessary to, to achieve um, profitability in the future. Um, and the unrealistic expectations of rising energy um, by localizing as much as possible. Interesting. And do you think that helps you in terms of resilience for future for sure. shocks? Yeah. It's, a, it's a necessity for survival, to be honest. You know, it's not realistic to um, continue to ship things across the world for, you know, multifaceted reasons, but, mm. but mainly um, to do it financial viability. Right. Interesting. Thank you. Well, I've ordered some of your uh, cauliflower hash browns, but I've not had a chance to try them yet. So do come back next year for the full review. Um, Jerry, I wondered, um, Samuel here is, is obviously in the thick of it, um, and you have more, something more of a bird's eye view at Citrix. Um, I wondered if you could comment on how much relocalization or diversification of supply chains has taken place since the start of the pandemic from your perspective, and, and also whether the, the disruptions we're talking about have affected the um, sorry, digitization of supply chains. Um. I think we've seen with our customers a lot of different approaches to that. I think in the manufacturing space, we've seen probably, I think it was 75% of UK manufacturers looking to, um, to localize or um, onshore or reshore. Um, however, I think for many uh, businesses, um, especially some in the retail space as well, we've seen rather than a diversification of local suppliers, we've just seen people carry more inventory locally as well um, because it takes time to build those new factories it takes time to find those new suppliers and where we often come into the mix is the, the onboarding of those new suppliers whether it's you know connecting their their people into the into a retailers uh, system securely or securing the apis around that um, so that that takes time but i think you're seeing a lot of other I think broader uh, political and economic elements playing into that. So in the US, we've you know, seen the Chips and Science Act this year, um, where they're investing heavily in local semiconductor production as well. I expect that to obviously have an, a knock-on effect. We're seeing things like here in the UK similar to that as well. Um, so I think businesses are, are attempting to do that, and there's obvious benefits. Um, you know, Sam mentioned about some of the, the cost and environmental benefits to doing that as well. But I think businesses are weighing that up against their well-established supply chains that they already have, right? Especially, we'll say, in the semiconductor space, there's a huge weight of capability, we'll say, in, um, in Asia that's going to be difficult to implement and overcome here as well. And I think 
in some conversations I've had, people are hesitant to throw out everything they've already done because mm. you know I, I think there was a study from the World Bank that if we if we do too much onshoring or reshoring too quickly, it's going to have a detrimental effect both to the local economies but to emerging economies as well. So people are weighing that up. Um, and again, factories take time, um, building out those new supply chains take time. But I think to your, the other part of your question, the digitization, that generally can be done quicker, um, especially with the you know, capabilities that are available now. So we're seeing much more interest in and investment in the digitization and how that can transform the supply chains. Mm. And also I think not just the shortening of the chains, the more, greater resilience in there, but great interest in how that can have uh, sustainability benefits as well, right? Um, making sure that you don't have empty containers floating around the world, making sure that you, you know, things are available, weighing up that the just-in-time demand or approach um, versus you know, the, the, the requirements for additional resiliency. So we're seeing people, I would say, within my customer base, effectively taking two broad approaches. One, looking at their overall supply chain and where that it would make sense maybe to reshore that or shorten that, but also digitization as part of a broader uh, digital transformation process mm. in, in the biggest sense, because I think we use the term digital transformation to mean pretty much everything at the moment. So, yes. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, as you've both mentioned, how the resilience and the sustainability agendas can sometimes actually dovetail um, quite nicely together. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think things like, you know, use of blockchain for traceability and some of those other emerging areas, um, the ability to use some of the, you know, some of the big data capabilities in the AI and ML to make more efficient, uh, make those supply chain more efficient. I think they're all areas that people are investing in. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's some hard material facts as well about where materials exist and where yeah. the factories that produce them exist as well today. Thank you. Um, and Fash, I wondered if we could come back to you. I have a, a fairly simple question for you, which is simply that you're the Chief Transformation Officer. Tell us about the transformation. <laughs> right, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but as I said at the beginning, you know, every is a business that has grown significantly uh, in the last few years. Um, we have uh, private equity shareholders who have as a lot of private equity shareholders do, very ambitious uh, plans for the business. And so you know, we've taken on a pretty uh, challenging and multifaceted transformation journey, um, which we're, you know, we're a couple of years in, into that journey. And I think the big elements of it are, um, firstly, in our operations. Um, because we've sort of scaled up so quickly, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do to kind of really bed in the growth and to really streamline our operations because for us, you know, our real uh, proposition to our clients is, is being the lowest cost, best value for money parcel delivery business in the UK, right? So at the heart of our transformation is maintaining that leadership, what we think is leadership in terms of the efficiency uh, and cost leadership in our, in our parcel delivery, right? So that's an important operational element to the program, but related to that is the quality and the service that we deliver, right? Because, you know, as in the scramble for growth, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the level of quality and service that we deliver is not consistently at the sort of 98, 99% level that we would like. So actually putting in place improvements in our processes, using data uh, to help drive that to, to drive that level of service performance up and the customer experience up is another big element uh, of our transformation journey. The third part of it is, the, um, is growth, right? So uh, the core of our business is large UK apparel retailers, and that remains the, the heartland of what we do. Uh, but in addition to that, we are looking to um, grow in you know, new parts of the market. Um, so international... Uh, shipping from UK retailers who want to reach consumers internationally is a new service that we've launched and actually we're seeing a lot of really exciting growth in international. Um, in addition to that, we've also launched Fulfillment, um, this is, which is more targeted at uh, SME retailers, not the large corporate retailers, where we do, in addition to doing parcel delivery, we also do warehousing and picking and packing, which gives a kind of one-stop shop for you know, 
you know, medium-sized retailers, which, which creates cost efficiency. It also creates a lot of um, energy and carbon efficiency because actually you're removing the number of transportation legs in the parcel journey from retailer to, to the customer. Um, the, the, the ESG agenda is you know, right at the top of our transformation uh, program, and, and we really do think about the E, the S, and the G um, in terms of transformation, and clearly, you know, we are a logistics business. We have a big carbon footprint, and so you know, having a plan to, you know, to, to, to deliver net zero operations to our retail customers is, is really important, and we have set out a net zero 2035 strategy. Um, we've built a roadmap which gets us to within something, you know, to, to, with a residual CO2 level of about 20% of where we are today. So we, our roadmap doesn't completely get us to net zero, albeit we're confident that with you know, innovation and technology over the coming you know, decade and a half, you know, we're pretty confident that we, we will get there. Um, and then the, the other part, in the sustainability space of our transformation program is all about um, people and labor. And, and also we have a, a network of self-employed couriers. And so actually having a sustainable, attractive uh, model in, it, when, when there's a significant war for talent out there for kind of final mile uh, delivery companies because we're competing with you know, Deliveroo and all of the, all of the delivery companies, putting in place a sustainable proposition for, for those self-employed couriers is another big part of our, of our transformation program. So those are kind of the, the, big, the big highlights, if you like, of, of the transformation program that we're undertaking right now. Thank you. And you anticipated my next question, actually, with the labour shortages. I mean, if, if you, um, have you sort of had to make significant changes in the light of that to what you offer? And, and I'm also wondering what your outlook is on the labour shortages, we've got, obviously got a fast-changing economic situation. How, will it continue to be this tight, in your view? Well, it's, look, it's hard, to, it's hard to predict what, what, what ex the exact conditions of the market in 12 months' time or 24 months' time. But what, what I can certainly say is, over the last few months and certainly over the next six months, we anticipate kind of ongoing real challenge in the labour market. And that, and that is causing us to... Uh, change some of the ways in which we in which we work. Some of these things we've been working on for a number of years, but some of them are more tactical in response to to where we are right now. And the big elements would be things like, you know, we're, we're looking to drive ever increasing automation in our in our operations. Right. So we we, we run a, a network uh, nationally across the UK of sortation hubs and depots, and we're, what we're looking to do is to increasingly invest in automation which is you know, much more machine work and far less kind of you know, labor in, 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 in our operations. But that, takes, that obviously takes time. You can't do that overnight. But that, that's a journey we started a while ago. And I think we're, we're, we're really seeing the dividends of those investments in automation that we, that we started to make even, even before the pandemic. Um, we, are, we are looking to accelerate our out-of-home, what we call our out-of-home delivery solution. So this is parcel shops and lockers, which are a lower cost, less carbon intensive, less labor intensive means of, 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 of getting uh, parcels to, to end consumers. So we're, so we're in a significant investment uh, wave in terms of our out of home uh, network. And then in terms of our labor model, you know, we are having to shift to a higher proportion of permanent labor versus temp labor in our operations. Because historically, we've had a probably about a 50-50 mix between permanent staff and, and agency staff. And what we're finding is, you know, relying on the agency market to go in for sort of short-term boost to labor is becoming more and more challenging. So we're sort of shifting to more of an 80-20 type model, you know, with, with employed, uh, employed staff versus, versus agency to kind of, you know, take away the volatility that we're seeing in that, in that agency market. But clearly to attract the right quality of permanent staff into our operations requires us to really think about our employee value proposition. We're clearly having to do things on the compensation side because there's just a lot of inflation and competition for, for people in the UK market. So you know, we're, we're deploying a, a range of different strategies 
to, to deal with this. Um, we're, we're pretty confident that we will be able to meet our obligations to, to our retailers um, in this market. But yeah, it's a, it's a constant you know, day to day, week to week, month to month challenge for us. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip ahead slightly because I can, I can see the clock ticking in front of me. And I want to make time, I want to make sure that we get um, time to talk about sustainability, which is um, so high on everyone's agenda at the moment. Um, and I thought we could come back to you, Samuel. Um, obviously, uh, as, a, as a B Corp, that's pretty kind of woven in for you. I just wondered if you could um, tell us about where the push or pull factors towards a more sustainable model are coming from. You know, is this something that consumers are demanding in stores or kind of where's the impetus um, coming from there? And, and I'm also wondering about... Um, sort of supply chain visibility and, and transparency, you've obviously got uh, a real eye on your emissions, how, how easy it is to, act, to actually track those. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's, it's pushed from us um, based okay. on, you know, mission-driven company ethos as opposed to pull from the consumer in the, in the way that we'd like, um, especially at the moment where the market is incredibly price-sensitive um, team just took me through a piece of research um, uh, uh, late last week, which in the UK of a series of 10 claims that we had been researching for on pack, uh, sustainability came ninth or, ninth or tenth on that list in terms of importance. And I think that's why companies like ourselves need to continue the education factor in doing what we're doing, even when there's not a consumer demand for it um, we um, and that's that's as you say interwoven into the business so it's definitely a uh, a push from smaller challenger brands like ourselves and you know some notable bigger players who are also involved in the likes of B Corp organizations um, we um, sorry I can't remember the second part of your question um, oh, just geez. about supply chain transparency How we oh yeah um, I mean we're, we're very honest um, and as clear and simple as possible because that's what the consumers want so um, I mean we've recently put um, our carbon figures on the front of our packaging um, so if you go into uh, any of the retailers that we exist in in the UK you'll see the amount of carbon per kilo that was used to actually uh, make the product. And we decided to do that um, whether, the, whether the carbon amount was good or bad on the basis of um, uh, earning improvement with the consumer but also for ourselves. So we're kind of policing ourselves by putting it out there of what it is in order to make that, that improvement. And the products are not all perfect and, and, and I think for us, you know, our objective is genuine improvement of the food system in all of its parts so transparency is key um, and you mentioned earlier on you know it's it, it is easier to do that from a clean slate as a younger company like we are um, but um, in times like these it's difficult to, to keep it up so I think our role is about educating the consumer while providing the the good food on how they can make better decisions about consuming and um, because all products are not equal, and um, ultimately there is a, you know, a, a price perception that a consumer has for every product. And you know, we've been trying to change that perception within the frozen aisle mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, you know, pretty much since you know horse meat scandal um, uh, about ten or fifteen years ago. And you know, it takes a long time to do that and change perception, but absolutely worth doing. Mm. Thank you. Um, gosh, challenging times um, for that project as many others. Um, Jerry, I wondered if we could um, come back to you. I mean, are you seeing a lot of demand for tech that enables supply chain transparency? I think uh, transparency, um, the whole, the general digitization, the ability. I love the fact that Sam talked about they were being transparent, whether it was a good message or a bad yes, message on the yeah. packaging. Because I think um, consumers, partners, suppliers, everyone's become more sensitive to greenwashing out there. So I think anything, anything where we can be more transparent is better. I think tech that allows you to track that, we're seeing uh, growth in that and growth in specific areas. 
I think the challenge sometimes is then as you yeah, adopt these new technologies is making sure that it's done in a manner that's uh, manageable, that's scalable, and that's secure as well, because you're also exposing additional threat vector or attack vectors on, on the internet as well. So I think businesses are, are looking at ways they can do these in, in the cost-effective manner. They're being asked to be transparent by their consumers out there, by their customers, but they're also concerned about how this might have an impact and maybe expose them to, to greater risks out there as well. Now, some of those risks are, 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 are IT risks or you know, IT security risks. Some of those are risks of just exposing what you're actually doing when you, when you become more transparent. So I right, think that yeah. also puts you know, additional pressure on an organization to transform what it's, what it's doing, some of its core principles, but that, that's a good thing too. Mm. Interesting. Um, and Fash, I think I'm right in saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you guys have set out a 2035 goal for net zero emissions. Um, and I'm just wondering if I could ask you a similar question to what I asked Samuel. Where's, you know, who's asking for that? Where's the pressure for that coming from? And, and what are the biggest challenges in reaching that goal for you guys? Yeah. Um, I, th I mean, the, 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 the factors are, there are a few factors. I mean, the first is clearly our, our retailers, our, our clients, are pushing hard for this because you know m many retailers have themse themselves taken on net zero commitments. We're a big part of the you know scope three footprint of retailers, and so you know r retailers are not going to be able to get to net zero unless players like us, who are a big part of that uh, that final mile, are also net zero. So there was definitely a sort of retailer imperative. I would say, I mean, it's similar to what Sam said, I, th I don't think the consumer pull per se was a big driver. Um, although, you know, uh, consumer attitudes are changing, although, you know, with, it's unclear how much consumers are willing to pay for, you know, for, for carbon neutral or carbon zero products. But I think the other element that's just been a big driver, I think, has just come from within the company, within the every employee base. There is just a strong commitment to doing the right thing. And actually, you know, most of our employees, most of our senior executives realize that we are not gonna have a viable business uh, in a few years time if we are not on the front foot from a, uh, from a net zero perspective. And so you know, we've, we've taken it upon ourselves to really push the envelope and, and try to lead our industry in terms of the ambition for our, for our net zero plans. Um, and, and, and on the net zero strategy itself, you know, just to give you a sense, if you take 100% of our carbon footprint, and we've now, we've now had our sort of second, we've done our second kind of audited carbon footprint. Um, if you take 100% of our footprint, 20% um, of it is, uh, is, is, is from su suppliers, so kind of you know, carbon that we import into our supply chain. About 40% of it is our own internal operations, our warehouses, our transport, and so on. And then about 40% is the final mile, which is the sort of self-employed couriers who do the, do the delivery of those parcels to, to homes across the UK. Um, we're, we're very confident on the 40%, which is directly within our control, We've got a very clear plan and we're making great progress in terms of getting that down to net zero. And that's through moving to kind of 100% renewables in all of our operations. We have about 40% of our trucking fleet, which operates on um, CNG biomethane, which is about 90% you know, reduced carbon compared to diesel. Um, as I said, we're rolling out uh, out of home delivery solutions uh, as an alternative to couriers delivering to home. So that 40%, we're very confident we've got a clear roadmap. In terms of the final mile, that is the most challenging. Because we don't directly control the vehicles that the couriers use, you know, it's all about actually migrating that final mile to electric. And that's challenging, right? So we're, we're deploying a lot of different strategies. In some cases, we are kind of directly uh, integrating vertically into that final mile. So in, great, in, in, a, in a lot of central London, we operate electric vans and we deliver through every employees. We're also looking at different incentive schemes to uh, motivate um, uh, couriers to adopt electric vehicles. And I think that that's a, it's a trickle right now, but we think that that momentum will really start to build in the, in the coming few years. Um, so there's a whole range of things that we have to do, but that final mile 
elect what, what we call the final mile, which is from our, the last point of our, our sortation network to people's homes. That's the really challenging part to electrify in a short space of time. Right. Thank you. Um, and I thought um, we should probably um, hand over to you guys if we have any questions from the floor. Um, looks like we've got one over here. Hi, uh, this is Saurav from Citibank. You know, I had one comment and one question actually. The comment is on what Sam and uh, Gerald touched on, you know, the globalization to localization of supply chains, right? You know, and it's a kind of a vicious circle, right? Because the moment, you know, the more local you become, you know, the cost pressures and, you know, you're losing the efficiencies of scale and others. And I think if you look at that, you know, eventually we're going a little reverse in time for whatever reasons and, you know, geopolitics being one of them. On the, on the, on the forward path for it, I have a question to understand which parts of supply chain in your businesses you think will still remain global and which will actually be make sense to become local or do you think everything should go one direction? Um, so our business is uh, heavily linked to agriculture and agriculture cycles and um, Seasonal consumption now is quite rare in mass consumerism within fresh and frozen food. So in order to stay relevant and on trend, uh, you know, in, in, as a challenger brand against major CPG companies, we've got to reinvent ourselves, you know, quite frequently, you know, every two to three years, launching new products, finding new markets, finding new channels. So um, what we try to do with the localization of our manufacturing is to try and use um, as many trends that fit that local cycle as possible. Um, you know, one of the very difficult things that we've, you know, found it quite tough to overcome is, you know, one of our USPs in the US market, for example, is, you know, an absence of non-GMO ingredients in our products where in a market of mass consumerism, that's a, you know, a normality in day to day. So sourcing vegetables in the US, you know, um, that have the right characteristics and aspects is very difficult for us. So even though we've localized manufacturing, we're still having to find, you know, better sources of ingredients that are further away than we'd like. So, you know, uh, we've started growing programs to grow better non GMO ingredients locally, but they take time. So, when agriculture is involved, it always takes a lot of time because you're either putting new varieties into the ground that are unproven in the soil types, et cetera, to get to market maybe three to five years later, um, and therefore having a slower and still global supply chain. Um, you know, the things that we'd like to eliminate sooner rather than later is you know, shipping things across oceans as opposed to being able to, to do that pure vertical integration locally. Um, so while our ambitions are as soon as possible, um, just innately as because of the industry we're in, it's going to take, take time. So for our R&D and new product development uh, departments, we're focusing on things that can be done locally from scratch as opposed to trying to chase trends um, globally at the same time. Um, I was, thank you, Sam. Um, I was interested in your point about parts of the supply chain that will remain global, and I wondered if that might be one for you, Jerry. You've already mentioned um, semiconductors as an area which, where we're not going to suddenly develop huge manufacturing capacity in fresh parts of the world. Are, are there other areas like that where you, you can't see shortening anytime soon? I mean, I think where there's already huge investment in manufacturing is going to take time. And there's things that w the reason we've seen, um, you know, particular spots become particularly relevant in, a, in an industry is they're very, very good at it. They have the build up of skill sets, they have the efficiencies, they have the integrated supp local supply chains that they need. It takes a long time to pick that apart if you wanted to pick that apart. 
But I think what we'll see is, um, again, probably more, some instances where it makes sense, where there's investment, right? I, I spoke about the, the US CHIPS Act, some of the investment that we're seeing here in some specific, specific skill sets. I think regulatory pressure will probably change some of that, um, specifically what's built within or made within each region. Um, and I think access to the talent to do that as well. I think that's been, you know, we uh, Fash mentioned that earlier as well. Access to the people to actually do the work is going to um, affect where you can actually move some of those supply chain elements as well. And I think even though there's ability for us, we've all kind of proved we can work from different locations, we can work uh, effectively remotely. That's really only affects probably about the one third of the workforce who are, are capable of working in that fashion and those people who need to be on the factory floor or on the front line of, of creating these um, these parts of the supply chain, they're obviously going to need to be co-located with where, where that infrastructure is. So I think it's uh, like everything we saw it probably in the 90s when we started to see a lot of trends for off offshoring things like contact center and then nearshoring and onshoring. I think what businesses are building now is probably both the flexibility and the resiliency in supply chain so they can take advantage of, of changes in the situation and where it makes sense to do things more locally or where you have to because of the, the sort of industry you're in, like Sam, it, it makes sense to try and find those new suppliers. But it also, it takes time, and I think there's still going to be a large pocket, we'll say, of the semiconductor industry in China, the US putting a lot of investment in the lat and, and, and gradually um, starting to develop capabilities and similar in other industries as well. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry, but I'm not sure we've got well. Maybe we can squeeze in one more quick question, if you could make it snappy. Thank you so much from over there. Hi, uh, I'm Sherwood from Cognizant. Um, uh, you mentioned sort of shortening um, the supply chain was key in fixing some of the issues in, in the long term. How do you see technology driving that process? How do we see technology driving the process of shortening supply chains? I think that might be another one for you, Jerry. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think we're, we've, we've seen, um, I mean, this is nothing, nothing new for anyone in the room, but we've seen a rapid digitization of a lot of businesses over the last few years. Um, and we've, even very, very traditional businesses have invested heavily in their, their B2C and B2B capabilities. And I think it's that and emerging technologies around that that support traceability, which comes back to the, to the sustainability element of that. Um, I think those are going to play factors in, you know, how traceable they are. I think to Sam's points about concerns about sourcing, we'll say vegetables in the U.S. I think the emerging technologies that support that kind of traceability are going to um, support uh, more localization of supply chains. And again, I think the, the growing capabilities around integration between different systems, so those API-led capabilities that allow different partnerships to evolve very, very quickly. I think just to roll back to like a, a point I made earlier, it takes a long time to build factories. It, you can roll out APIs and integrate with people a lot more quickly. I mean, given the reality of security and regulation and things like that. But I think that's, it's that ability to integrate uh, take advantage of capabilities and also take the data from that integration and see where things make sense more locally versus um, going back to a more global supply chain. And there's going to be realities in that based on the industry you're in, right? If you're a, you know, a fashion retailer, if a huge amount of your production is already done, we'll say in, in, in the Far East, um, it may take time to bring that on shore. Um, but there may be elements of that that you can use digitization to bring on new partners quicker in that space as well. Uh, so sorry, very, very roundabout answer to, uh, to probably a question that probably needs another session at the next uh, <laughs> FT Live event. <laughs> Thank you. Send us your requests now for next time. Um, we're going to have to wrap up there, but thank you so much to all our panellists. It's a real privilege to sit there with, or sit here with all of you today and, and um, hear your perspectives. So thank you, Sam, Jerry, and Fash, and thank you to everyone for being with us. Um, and I think we're back over to Andrew. Thank you.